Good morning, and welcome to Delhi United Methodist Church. We're glad you braved the weather to be with us this morning, and those of you who are live receiving us from live stream, welcome to our service. Uh, Sunday school will begin on Sunday, February February 7th uh, from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. Confirmation class will also begin on February 7th from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock at the pastor's house. Um, the Delhi Missions Conference 2021 will be here in Delhi at our church and from nine o'clock till noon and if there are some other members who are not members of the mission team other people who are not members of the mission team who would like to attend i'm sure you are quite welcome to come to it do we have any other announcements then let's begin our service Creator God, praise is a natural response to your greatness. When I enter into your presence in worship, I praise you. When I consider who you are and what you have done for me, you alone are worthy of my highest praise. I lift my voice to you now and glorify you, and I long to give you praise and glory my whole life long. Praise and glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. Amen. Our opening hymn is Waymaker. Waymaker. 
Let's stand. Be with you. Let us pray. Holy Father, look down on us with compassion. Rid us of our lives and deceit, anger and hatred, gossip and slander. Break down the walls we have constructed to protect ourselves from unknown fears. In your mercy and love, hold us steadfast to your breast. Keep us from stumbling and falling in our struggles. For it is by clinging to you and taking in your word that we can live a victorious life. Give us the never-ending desire to drink in your word as a baby sucks milk. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. As we have received grace and love in Jesus Christ, let us share Christ's peace with one another. <laughs> you may be seated. 
Our first scripture this morning comes from Psalm 79, verses 1 to 10. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They have left the dead bodies of your servants as food for the birds of the sky, the flesh of your own people for the animals of the wild. They have poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem. And there is no one to bury the dead. We are objects of contempt to our neighbors, of scorn and derision to those around us. How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and devastated his homeland. Do not hold against us the sins of past generations. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us, O God, our Savior, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, Where is their God? Before our eyes make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. Our next hymn will be Thy Word is a Lamp, number 601. Please. seated. Our next scripture is from 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so by, that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, the living stones, are being built into a scriptural, scriptural house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For scripture it says... See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. 
but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Loving God, as we dive into your word and seek to live victoriously, may your spirit be present with us. May our hearts be open to what you would have us to teach, learn. And I also pray that the Buffalo Bills will win this afternoon. Amen. <laughs> Sorry. Mahomes is going to get Mahomed. All right. Can't help myself. <laughs> What do you crave? What do, what do you desire to learn? What drives your life? In the 1950s and 60s, there was a movement in Europe where youth would, uh, had a desire to reach a ton. Now, we think of a ton and we think of a weight of measure. For youth in the 50s and 60s in Europe, it meant going 100 miles an hour. That was what they craved. And yet, the motorcycles of the time could not do those kinds of speeds. They just hadn't developed them far enough. And so, youth, uh, with a desire to go 100 miles an hour plus, decided that they would take up a project known as the Cafe Racer. And I'll tell you in a minute why, how that name came about. But they would buy these standard bikes that were heavy and kind of rough looking. They just, they didn't, they didn't appeal to youth. And, and it, at the, in the 50s and 60s, they didn't yet have the modern day crotch rocket or what they call sport bike. So what they would do is they would buy these standard bikes and then they would go into their garages and they would chop them and weld them and tune them and change out the carbs and do some work to the motors and lessen the weight and streamline them. And then they would take them and drive them to a local cafe and then they would sit in the cafe having drinks and then some other kid would pull up on his motorcycle and the one who was inside would run outside with their friend and say, hey, you want to race? And they said, sure. And then they would race from that cafe to another one. Well, truck drivers frequently visited those cafes, and they, it was actually the truck drivers in Europe that called them, the youth of that day, cafe racers. The cafe racer was the precursor to the modern day sport bike. But how in the world did these kids, you can see a picture of a group of them there with their, their cafe racer, how did they learn to do that? Did they just one day decide, I'm going to go and I'm going to build a sport bike out of a pre-existing standard motorcycle? And the answer is no. They had to learn. They had to gain knowledge and understanding. They had to understand mechanics and, and engine mechanics and, and, uh, and compression. They had to understand the ratio between gas and air mixture and how to tune a carburetor to get more power out of an engine. They also had to understand rate to speed ratios and how by lessening certain amount of weights on the vehicle, they could increase the speed of that bike. All things that they needed to learn to be able to take an old bike or a standard bike and turn it in to what at that time would have been a modern day street racing motorcycle. This kind of love and desire took strong learning curves in the lives of these youth. And today, in our study of the book of Peter, we're going to continue to look at how do we live victoriously in this chaotic world we live in. If you recall, the first week we talked about how do we live victoriously in a world full of adversity. And we talked about how maybe we don't suffer like the people of the, the Gentile uh, Christians did back in Rome in AD 63 and 64 when they were being murdered for their faith. But we still face challenges each and every day in adversity to our faith, but also to how we live our lives from the culture around us. And, and how do we live in the midst of this? The second Sunday, we looked at how do we live victoriously without losing our hope? Because we're in a world that at times is rather hopeless. Well, today, we're going to look 
at the secret to living a victorious life. And I want to start by reading for, to you out of First uh, Peter 1, verses 22 to 25. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the fields. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. When we speak of influence, Peter is reminding these believers that their influence came from God, came from the Word of God. And, and, and it is the, here in these first three verses of chapter 2 that I want to put our emphasis today. But in order to understand the first few verses of chapter 2, we needed to read those last few verses of chapter 1. And the question I have for you is, and I've taught you all this before, but when you see the word therefore in the first verse of any scripture passage, what does that mean? Does anybody remember? This is non-rhetorical. What does it mean when you read it, therefore? It means you need to go back. You see, what it is, is it, it was a, in that time, that was a writer's way of saying, based upon what I've just shared with you, I'm about to give you a directive. So therefore, because of what I just told you, do this. Well, sometimes when an author writes, therefore, we have to go back maybe a chapter, maybe two chapters or three chapters, or maybe just a few verses. In this case, verses 22 to 25 that I just read you. And so Paul, Peter says, because you have been born again by the word of God, therefore... And then he gives a vice list. We've all had them before, vice lists, when mom or dad says, these are the things I don't want you to do when you go out tonight, and you list off all the things that you expect, and we've all done it, right? Those are vice lists, and vice lists are not a new concept. They've been around since the earliest days of humanity. And they were common in Peter's time. A teacher or a rabbi would, would look at his or her students and say, Now, I'm about to send you out. Here is the vice list. Do not. Da -da 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 -da. And if you do, you will dishonor me and what we are teaching. And so Peter provides them with a vice list. But what's interesting is he starts from the broad and becomes more specific. What do I mean by that? Well, he says, put away all malice. Now, malice, we, when we think of malice, we think of it as doing something mean to someone, being malice in what we do. But in the Greek, excuse me, that word is actually a broad word that means all kinds of sin. So basically, anything that does harm, anything that is wrong, put it all away. Be done with it. And then he says... That you are also to give up uh, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. All of these would do what? Based on therefore, would have a direct impact on our ability to love one another. Oh, how good we are at that last one. How good we are at, at that one called slander, aren't we? Where we talk horrible about someone else. How, you know, I learned very quickly coming to Delhi that there is quite the grapevine in this town. I was joking around the other night with someone because I said, yeah, I'm surprised I haven't gotten any phone calls or heard any rumors around about the pastor being arrested the other day. Oh, why is that? Oh, the sheriff showed up at my house at 9 o'clock last week. What? Like, yeah, and then I looked at him, and he did. He actually did stop by, the sheriff's deputy did, because he had a question for me about something. And I said, do you realize what you have just done? And he starts laughing. And he's like, yeah, I know, you're the pastor, and the rumors are going to be spreading. But, you know, you think about it, that's what we become. But what happens is, is what is what, when we talk about the grapevine here, is it usually positive, or is it negative? It's usually negative. 
How often do we slander our neighbor in conversation with others? When's the last time you went up to somebody in the community and they said, oh, did you hear about this person? And you said, oh, I know that person. They are wonderful. They are such kind people. Oh, wasn't expecting that response. Why? Because we're so used to living in the negative. I was on Facebook last night and uh, just scrolling through for a minute and this friend of a friend that I have on Facebook made a post and he said, you know, he was making a statement about politics, always dangerous, and, um, and then this person gets on and starts giving a rebuttal and then another friend pops on and starts their rebuttal and within about two responses it went from well this is what I think to your this it went from a conversation to all-out war to name calling why don't you just get off Facebook why don't you just die I mean it, it this is what our society has come to and Peter is saying look you're supposed to be loving one another and yet I have to tell you not to do this? And this is the world that we're in. And so Peter, in an effort to expand on this lesson of this vice list, goes into a great analogy or a great picture of, of what this means. He uses that of a nursing mother. Now, th those of you who are mothers and have nursed, when is, is there a schedule for a baby's feeding time? There is, when they want it, right? There is, and so when you are a mom with a baby, you basically are at their every whim because, and, and how often when you were nursing, or if you currently are who are watching online, is it a convenient time for a baby to say, um, I'm hungry? It's never a convenient time. But that baby needs that nourishment. Well, in the ancient Near East, uh, they didn't have medical technology like we have today and, or the uh, refrigeration systems so that a mom could store up milk so that she could feed her baby when it, was inconvenient, when it wasn't a good time or um, if she ran out because the baby ate too much. Well, back then, they believed that the most impressionable years of any person were during infancy because they believed in the process of, of sharing milk or, or getting that nourishment from mother that child was being taught and impression was being formed that would help them to become the young woman or man that they would become one day and so but because they didn't have modern technology what they would often do is hire what's known as a nursemaid and a nursemaid was a mother who had already nursed her children but had not dried up and so she would uh, be hired to feed another mother's baby when she couldn't and so they had very high standards of the type of woman that they would find to be a nursemaid for their child because they thought it was such an impressionable time in a baby's life. Well, Peter, understanding this and understanding how a baby functions and how a baby, when it wants to eat, it wants to eat and it wants nothing else. You know, it's like, I want my food and I want it now. And he says, like newborn babies crave spiritual milk. Crave spiritual milk. And so he challenges them with this. It's just like a baby and its desire, its deep desire to, to be fed whenever it wants to be fed. And that's what it's living for at that time. And a mother is going out of her way to make sure that the best is provided for her baby. So too, you are to crave God's word, God's truth. You see, the only way we're able to do, find victory according to, to the sin and the vices of this world is through our craving of God. And he said it at the end of chapter 1. And where was our salvation from? The word of God. What was the word of God? Jesus said it in John 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. For in the beginning was the word, John chapter 1. And the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ is our source of truth. And where do we find that truth at? In God's holy word. And so, looking 
at how we live our lives, what is it that drives you? What is it that, that gets you going, that helps you to live faithfully? Do you just say, say well, I, I go to church on Sunday, and I get a little bit of a message from Pastor Keith when he's not out of his mind, and, you know, and I actually not feel like sleeping through it, and I get a little bit of a cup fill, and then I can go about my day, right? Um, and then that takes care of me until hopefully the next week. And that's how we typically as Christians in America live our lives. We have our passions. Sunday is God's time. We give God that. And then the rest of the week is ours. But the problem is, how's that working for you? They know it doesn't work for me. Because if we're truly going to grow and live victoriously, we need to be able to grow and understand. In, 2000, or in 2008, I began riding motorcycles. And I, be, and I fell in love. Absolutely fell in love. I bought my first bike after taking about a year to talk my lovely wife into letting me get a bike. And the only way I was able to pull it off was that was when gas prices were at six or five something a gallon. And I said, think about all the gas money we're going to save if you let me get a motorcycle. And it worked. Thank God. And, um, and, and I began riding. But as I began to grow in my desire to ride, I also found myself falling in love with European style cafe racers. And I love working with my hands. And so for the next, oh, couple few years, I had been looking around and searching the internet, and I'd have pictures that I'd look at, like, man, it'd be so cool to build one of those. So I continued to search, and over the years, I'd come across an old bike in a barn, and I'd get it, and, and, but it, and it would be like an old bike from the 60s or 70s, and it's like, yeah, but it's missing a motor. And then I'd spend six months trying to find a motor, and I couldn't find one, so I gave up on that to the trash heap. And then I'd find another bike, and then one day in January of 2018, I was in Waterloo, Cedar Falls, having lunch with uh, my clergy covenant group, and I was sitting at the table with Pastor Matt German, and some of you know him, he's also the one who's installed our uh, monitors here at the church, and we're talking about motorcycles, and he says, Keith, after lunch, stop by my house. Okay. And so we, after lunch, we went and he opened up his garage, and there she was. There was like this ray of light just shining out from her and all of her glory. Like, this is the bike. And I mean, it was like angels from heaven were singing hallelujah when that door opened. And he's, I said, you have a CX-500D. Do you have any idea what you have? And he goes, I have a bike and I don't want it. You want it? How much do you want for it? It's a gift. Here's the title. It runs, but it needs work. And I said, you do realize what I'm going to do to this bike, right? And he goes, Keith, enjoy the bike. It's yours. And so I took that bike home, and, and I didn't see its glory as the way it was now, but what it could become. And so for the next two years of my life, I spent reading books, reading mechanics manuals, watching more YouTube videos than I've ever watched in my entire life. I even found a, a forum online called the CX500 Forum, and there were literally thousands of riders of CX500s all over the planet who all had the same vision I did of making that bike into a cafe racer. And so for the next two years of my life, I invested time and energy into learning everything I needed to learn about that bike. I sucked in all of the information I could get. Bought the books and the magazines and left. I would, I would run into a snag and I'd jump on the forum and say, hey, has anybody ran into this before on their CX? And like within minutes, I'd have somebody from Australia say, yeah, this is what you need to do. And I did all the work myself. And two years later, the bike is done, and most of you have seen it in town, and I built that bike. It's the first time I ever showed you what it originally looked like. Now flip back to the one before. That's what it was, and now what it is. That is my pride and joy. 
I built it with my own two hands, but I had to learn. I had to grow. I had to gain an understanding. I had to do what all those guys in the 50s and 60s did. I had to learn about tuning carbs and, and removing exhaust and resynchronizing them and, and lowering the weights and lowering the, the bike, but not in so much that the bike would fall over or over vibrate. I had to find the right balances. I had to do all the modifications. I had to, I took, that bike originally weighed 450 pounds. It now weighs 325 roughly. I dropped over 150 170 pounds off the bike and it goes fast but I have not breaking, broken the law riding it more than once <laughs> um, it's a fun bike but here's the thing folks is as much as I had a passion to build that bike do you know what I was also doing during the two years that I built that bike I was going to seminary I was putting in hours and hours and hours of study, of reading. Why? Because I wanted to grow in my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I read, I did the math. In the four years of seminary, I read over 50,000 pages of books. I have a stack of books. I stacked them up. It was about this high of all the books I read in seminary. Do I remember it all? Heck no. But you know what? It changed me. Because at the end of the day, even though I had a passion to build that bike, it did not change my passion for Jesus Christ. It did not weaken, I did not give less time to God and more time to that project. Why? Because I want to be the man that God wants me to be. I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good father and friend. I want to be a person that reflects the love and grace of Jesus Christ. I want to be the kind of man that forgives and lets it go. I want to be a man who's patient, still working on that one. Um, you know, I want, to be, I want to be godly. And the only way that happens is when I invest as much energy and more as I did into that bike into my own walk with Christ. And so my challenge for you, church, is this. What is driving you? What do you spend all of your hours craving? Do you have passions like mine, but do you still have a passion to grow in grace? We are not meant to be stagnant. We are meant to be growing, to finding passion and excitement in life. Does God love what I do? Yes, God loves it. That I'm enjoying and making the most of my life, but at the same time, God loves it more when I'm investing in my relationship with him. And so I want to offer this as, as a time that we are, we are beginning to move ahead in 2021, starting to open things back up again. People are getting vaccinated, and I did not grow a tail or a hair, as you can see, when I got mine this week, so it's perfectly safe, although I really would have liked a full head of hair. Um, maybe the second one will give me that. But, you know, we, we want to begin to grow again as a church, and the Ad Council at Delhi United Methodist Church voted last month to make one of our priorities in 2021 to make discipleship a major focus of our church. And so what, I mean, what we mean by discipleship is ministry and personal growth outside of this service. So in Lent's coming up and just around the corner, and we've got a book that I will be uh, rolling out probably next Sunday that you will all be able to purchase. It's a great book. Um, that we're going to study during the 40 days of Lent. And one of my hopes is to get small groups going. Groups that will meet in a living room or a restaurant or here at church or online. But an opportunity for, those of you, for some of you to get together in groups of two or three or four or five to grow in grace. We're also starting up confirmation here in a couple of weeks. And I've got a phenomenal team of leaders that are going to teach our youth and help them grow in their faith. And we're going to have fun doing it. And then we're going to have a mission trip and a retreat and a bunch of fun stuff with them to help them grow and own their faith for themselves and find their place in the church. Sunday school is going to be starting up again here pretty quick. Also in the first of next month. Folks, the church is here to provide you ways to grow, but the question is, are you craving it? Are you craving that spiritual milk? And if you are, then let's do something about it. Let's grow together as a church family into the women and men that God wants us to be. Let us pray. Loving God, 
There are so many distractions in this world, so many passions that we have, those things that drive us, that excite us. And those things are okay when they fit in their place. But it's my prayer that we as your church would crave you more than anything because it is through you that we have been redeemed and restored. May we grow by craving your spiritual milk, becoming the people you want us to be. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. In response to God's word this morning, we'll be singing the song, Ancient Word. Thank you. As we continue in our worship this morning, we want to lift up joys and concerns of the people and take some time for those. We want to pray for support and healing for Kim Evers, Josh Holt, Dennis Orr, Rodney Bacon, all the teachers and students and our essential workers throughout this pandemic. We want to pray for the families of Frank Mead and Al Nuri and also 
for Vicki and Gary Morris and their family in the death of Vicki's dad, Cecil Downs, who passed away yesterday morning. Uh, we'll be doing a graveside service on Thursday um, at Evergreen Cemetery. I will know more information uh, in the days ahead for that. But keep Vicki and all of their family in your prayers. What a neat man. Um, what a blessing it was to be able to sit by his chair and see the smile on his face when I asked him if I could pray over him. And uh, he was much loved. And today he is with the love of his life and glory. And so, Vicki, our love is with you and our prayers is your church. And we are here for you. I want to lift up all of our men and women in service to this country for our first responders and emergency personnel. Are there any other requests you would like to lift up this morning? All right. We will go to the Lord and ask his prayer, lift these up in prayer. We will also ask God's blessing upon the offering. We will not sing the doxology this morning uh, since we have the band today and not the pianist. And uh, if you have gifts to bring or give, you may drop them off in the plate or mail them or drop them off at the church during the week. Because I'll be honest, it gets lonely here. So it's always nice when somebody drops in to say hi. So feel free to drop in. I love the visits. Let us pray. Loving God, we... Thank you that you redeemed us by Christ's blood, and it's in the word of truth that we can grow in grace and live victoriously in a world that is so broken and lost. Lord God, may we crave you as a baby craves nourishment. May we crave you more than any other desire in this world. Lord God, we lift up all those who are ill, who are recovering from procedures, who are being treated, those who are awaiting procedures. Lord God, put your grace and healing hand upon them. Give them comfort and peace. May they know that their eternal destiny is secured in you. And they can rest that knowing that they're in the hands of the great healer. Lord, we lift up the families of Frank Mead and Al Nuri and for Cecil Downs. All people who love their families loved you. Our God, welcome them home into your loving arms. For those of us who are left behind with a hole, a hole that was filled by them, fill that hole with your Holy Spirit. Wrap your loving arms around them. Give them comfort and peace. Remind us of our hope that is in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for all of the women and men in uniform who are in our military, our police officers, firefighters, frontline medical workers. Lord, we give thanks to you for all of them and ask a special blessing upon them. Ask a blessing upon all who serve to care for us when we are in need. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the offering that is given. May it be used to further your kingdom in this community and throughout the world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand and we'll sing our closing hymn, The Ancient Words Reprise.
I know some of us don't like to read. Others don't like crowds. But you know, we are called to crave God's living word. And so I want to encourage you, if you don't like to read or don't like to talk in front of groups, but still want to grow, there are ways to do that. I'd love to talk with you about that and how you can grow in God's grace in a way that fills your heart and fills your soul and helps you to love one another better and sincerely. So go, knowing the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.